What's up, ladies and gentlemen? The Podfather Nate here from the Journey into Comics podcast, the flagship show of the Journey into Comics network. I just want to make sure you guys know you can tune in every single Monday for a brand new episode of our show, where if it's comic book related, we've got you covered. The following, the following, the following. Is a journey into comics. 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 Network. 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 Production. Production. To a nicer guy, it couldn't happen. I'm the man of the hour. The man with the power. Diamonds are forever. He put hard times on Dusty Rhodes and his family. And so what you gonna do, Andre? History beckons the Macho Man. Yeah. The best there is. The best there was. Austin 316 said I just whipped your ass. Two words for you. Two words. Do I have everybody's attention now? What's up, ladies and gentlemen? Welcome to another episode of Journey into Wrestling. It's Season 3, Episode 7. I am your host, Nate. And today, joining me, a very special guest, all the way back from the Attitude Era. Welcome to the show for the first time ever. Head, how's it going? Quit rubbing your face against the mic head. It's fucking weird. Anyways, guys, what's up? How's it going? Hope everybody's having a fantastic fucking Sunday. Uh, we're recovering from a busy couple weeks in the WWE professional wrestling world. So we're going to talk about it because there's a lot of shit to talk about. Last time I talked to you guys was mostly exclusively Bound for Glory news, which was a lot of fun to cover. Now we're going to move on back into the WWE thing and talk about WWE Evolution. So, Evolution, as you guys know, was the first ever all-women's pay-per-view event uh, touted by the WWE. Uh, The event took place in Nassau Veterans Veterans Memorial Coliseum in Uniondale, New York. And it was the first, like I said, professional WWE pay-per-view to consist solely of all-women's matches. No men on the card whatsoever. So, here's some interesting things. I want to say, before we get here, it it was actually cool, the build-up of this, because <clears throat> a few years ago, to look back at women's wrestling, it wasn't what it is now. And there well, there weren't great matches happening, and it was, I mean, Jesus, there were people that were legitimately making jokes, and I'm not going to lie, at some points I was one of them. Oh, the chicks match is happening? It's time to go get fucking popcorn. Oh, the ladies match is on? Time to go take a piss. Oh, the women are having a wrestling match, or they're having a pillow fight in their middle of the ring. Might as well stick around for the pillow fight, because a boob might pop out or something. That would be hot. Never did, typically, but, you know, uh, that's live. Anyways, what I'm saying is, is that it used to be not what it is. And now you don't want to miss a women's match. You don't want to miss what they're doing, because there are so many talented competitors in the WWE and in all the professional wrestling there are amazing professional wrestlers in Impact, and there are amazing professional wrestlers that are working New Japan and ROH and all that. So let's get down to it and talk about the card that we saw from the pay-per-view Evolution. Let's get right into it. So one thing to note, Rhea Ripley defended her UK Women's Championship against Dakota Kai at this event, but it was a dark match officially, and let's... uh. Bam. That sounded awesome. It was like a cow. Uh, anyways, <clears throat> so that was a dark match before the main like the the main card took place. The main card kicked off with one hell of a first match for pay-per-view. Trish Stratus and Lita making their return to pay-per-view to defeat Mickey James and Alicia Fox with a hurt Alexa Bliss that had to hurt her pride to not be a part of this event when she is such a big reason that the women's division is what it is. No questions asked. You can't argue that at all. A lot of what Alexa Bliss has done has helped make this women's evolution even bigger than it was. So tag team match, it was a good match. It wasn't bad. Uh, Trish and Lita, there was a little ring rust, and there were some interesting spots, and Lita's moonsault thing was not that could have ended badly. 
but overall, great match. Trish and Lita come away with the win, defeating Mickey and Alicia Fox. Uh, and then up next, we get right down into it. 20 women battle royal for a future women's championship match, meaning whoever wins the battle royal will eventually get <clears throat> an opportunity at one of the championships. Who knows which? So we had a lot of competitors in this match. I am going to list them by the order of their elimination. Okay, so we had Peyton Royce, Billy Kay, a returning Molly Holly, Kelly Kelly, Tori Wilson, Sonya Deville, Alundra Blaze, Maria Kanellis, Lana, Mandy Rose, Dana Brooke, Michelle McCool, Naomi, Carmella, Ivory, Asuka, Tamina, Zelina Vega, and Ember Moon as well as Nia Jax, right? So, let me take a quick drink break. This one is, as always, brought to you guys by Poor Entertainment. Come check them out every other Tuesday right here on the Journey Into Comics Network at journeyintocomics.com. I'm going to take this quick drink. <sighs> Delicious Pepsi. Man, something about it. As you can guess by the order of operations and how I listed those names, <clears throat> Nia Jax ends up winning the 20 women battle royal for that future opportunity by eliminating her friend Ember Moon. Great battle royal. I love Zelina Vega sneaking in at the end, making it th everybody think that she thought she won and she hadn't even done shit yet. And then, like, she doesn't end up winning, and it's kind of this cool turn because there was a point where I was kind of like, maybe Selena Vega does get over here. It would be an interesting way to push her higher up into the crop if you want her to, you know, to really shine. But that's not the route they went. They go with Nia Jax. Nia ends up winning. Good for her. She deserves it. I'm not sure I like the post match interviews kind of like they do in the UFC. Like, you're not Joe Rogan, and also. These girls are not going to say my balls was hot. Uh, that's a UFC inside joke if you if you if you watch the UFC. Anyways, uh, up next on the card was Tony Storm and Lo Shirai in the finals of the May Young Classic. Essentially, one of these women getting a contract guaranteed by the WWE to move into the like um, you know NXT roster and and flourish there as uh, you know, uh, Shayna Baszler and Kyrie Sane both did last year. Of course, Kyrie Sane won. Shayna came in later, but uh, Kyrie has been champion. You know, and uh, we'll get with we'll get with her in a minute. So Tony Storm versus Lo Shirai, uh, great back and forth battle. These two showed why they were stars and standouts throughout the May Young Classic. Uh, they go about ten minutes and twenty seconds. Ultimately, Tony Storm defeating Lo Shirai. Now, we move on to the next match of the night. It was Sasha Bailey and Natalia versus the Riot Squad. Shout out to Ruby Riot from Lafayette, Indiana, uh, which is the Riot Squad being Ruby Riot, Liv Morgan, and Sarah Logan. Six-woman tag match. You know that money is money, and Sasha Banks is made of money. So Sasha Banks, Bailey, and Natalia defeat the Riot Squad soundly. 13-minute match. It was good. You know, classic. Uh, I liked that Natalia wasn't really getting a lot of action for a bit. It was mostly Bailey and Sasha back and forth. And Natalia seemed almost kind of forgotten about. But when she got in for the hot tag and started to kind of turn things around, it was really... I mean, they, they put on a hell of a match. It was really good. I was really into it. Uh, it was a lot of fun. Uh, match six of the night was Shayna Baszler up against Kyrie Sane. Uh, Kyrie Sane coming in as your NXT Women's Champion having defeated Shayna Baszler back at NXT Brooklyn 4 uh, with that wicked, uh, you know, uh, she was in the Kirafuda clutch, and she rolled into a pinning combination, and that's how she beat Shayna. So she had this just, like, shock win on her, and then now here in the rematch, Shayna, with some help and shenanigans from her friends in the other four horsewomen or whatever the fuck they're going to be called. Jasmine Duke though was one of the one of the two. There was another one. I can't think ever think of that girl's fucking name. It was Jasmine Duke and uh Mar what is it? Marina Shafir? Yeah, I think so. So it was Marina du Marina Shafir and Jasmine Duke 
ringside and they got involved and essentially Basler puts the cure food to clutch onto Kyrie Zane. Kyrie did not tap. She just went out. So uh, Sasha, uh, Shayna Baszler wins by a technical submission and is your two-time NXT Women's Champion. She is the first two-time, I think, right? Is that true? First two-time? Yeah, she became the first two-time NXT Women's Champion. Got to go with my gut sometimes, folks. It's like I feel like I know the knowledge and then I don't trust myself because I don't want to miss inform you guys. I already think I you know, do an only okay job. Anyways, uh, up next on the card is, let's just get it out of the fucking way. Match of the night, easily. Uh, longest match of the night, best match of the night, first time this match has ever been done. Nothing compares to this. It was it was totally brilliant, brutal, uh, well done. They told a fucking incredible story. Of course, I'm talking about Charlotte Flair versus your SmackDown Live Women's Champion Becky Lynch in the Last Woman Standing match. And let me tell you what. It was fucking good. It was intense. It was one of those things where, you know, you're you're watching and you're just like, how much worse can this train wreck of a match get? Because it's like, great, it's beautiful. They're they're telling an amazing story and there's this betrayal of friendship and all these other things at play and the fact that the women's championship is the biggest thing. And you've also got Becky Lynch who's kind of become this new persona of Becky who's much more, uh, let's say... 24 7 always heal you know she's living that heel life um, and i'm talking fucking calling people out on twitter which was we'll get to that in a second too so becky lynch versus charlotte flair back and forth putting everything online using tables using ladders using chairs lots of chairs lots of crazy spots uh spots with the announcer table i mean they did it all it was Holy shit. I mean, it was just beautiful across the board. Ultimately, though, there's an amazing powerbomb from the top rope through another table. Flair can't get to her to her feet. And ultimately, Becky Lynch retains, which is awesome. It was great to see Becky Lynch retain her SmackDown Live Women's Championship. Even though her and Charlotte are in this long feud... Much like the days of yore, I think Becky needs to just hold on to this title for as long as she can. She's got that uh, kinetic CM Punk energy when he was on his longest title reign of 434 days. Like, if if they can just keep her healthy and just honest to God, don't fuck it up. Let her be champ for a long time. You guys, there's something really special that could happen with Becky Lynch. And I'm talking, uh, you know, uh, Charlotte has her own notch. She beat Asuka's streak and, you know, has won all these titles and accolades and things. And and Sasha Banks has all these accolades and things and won, winning championships and whatnot. Bailey has won some titles and whatnot. But I really genuinely think that Becky carving her own path as being the longest tenured SmackDown Live Women's Champion and going for like a year and change as champ, almost to where it's like kind of obnoxious that she hasn't lost. Like if this time next year in season four, I'm like, fuck, remember when I said Becky Lynch shouldn't lose? Yeah, let's change that. She needs to fucking lose. I'm sick of seeing her with the title. That's what I want to have happen because I think she deserves a long, ridiculous reign. Even if sometimes the tactics are dirty, even if sometimes the tactics are not forthright, I think Becky Lynch is a phenomenal competitor. I loved seeing her perform. I loved the last women's standing match that her and Charlotte put on. I think Charlotte needs to get way more fucking credit. That girl can just like cry on command. She's the queen of crying. And I i don't mean that like negatively. But she sold. And I'm sure. Listen. I am sure that some of the bumps. And a lot of the bumps they took on each other. Fucking hurt. Getting body slammed onto a fucking ladder. Not cool, man. Um, but she sold it like it was so much worse. Like even, like you felt for her. Like holy shit, Charlotte, please be okay. Like I don't want you to hurt anymore. You know, it would be, it'd be very sad if you hurt a, you know, more. And she didn't. So uh, could be. And I'm saying that she didn't because she ultimately didn't get the fuck back up. She was KO'd. She loses the match. 
Becky Lynch is your champ. Keep it going, Becky Lynch. And her next opponent is going to be cray cray. We're going to talk about that here in a minute as we get on the other side. We're going to kind of we're we're going in order, folks. You guys are going to see how the WWE day shapes out. Final match of the WWE Evolution was Ronda Rousey versus Nikki Bella with Brie Bella at her side like there was ever a question. It was interesting because there was a little bit of shenanigans and Ronda did get in a little bit of rough spots in a couple spots, you know, like where she didn't look like maybe the strongest competitor. But you knew that when she went to snap mode, it was fucking over and she just whipped that ass and is still undefeated. So now they got this big, long streak going for Ronda. Becky's not going to break it, unfortunately. But Becky and Ronda are going to have something coming up against each other in the near future we're going to talk about. So ultimately, what do I think about WWE Evolution? I think it's a great, a great starting point. I really do. I think they need to have two pay-per-views a year. A spring one and a fall one. And I think that, you know... Maybe they need to have a higher stakes match where it's something big on the line, not just like, oh, a random future opportunity, but almost money in the bank asking. Of course, you already have the money in the bank, pay per view and match and stuff like that. You don't need to double recreate it. But what I'm more saying is with Evolution, doing Evolution 2 or 3 or whatever, you know, like, I feel like they need to consider go big or go home. Elimination Chamber, maybe. Uh, do something outside of the box that you guys haven't seen before, obviously. Or do something, mix it up. Make a crazy event where champions can switch shows or some, you know, some something bigger on the line. Make it bigger, 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 bigger. And I'm all for it because I think these women are, the, the time is fucking super right for all of them to shine and for all of them to kick lots and lots of ass. They are all amazing performers in their own right for their own different ways. You know, sometimes I dog on certain professional performers and athletes, but they're still out there doing what they love. They're still entertaining and they're still fun. You know, even if they annoy me, they're doing their fucking job. Oh my God, we have fucking immaculately huge news to cover that I'm getting ready to get to. And uh, I have to shift here because while everything in evolution, evolution is all fun and games. Sometimes the world of professional wrestling can be not so fun and games. Now, uh, I say that, well, I say that because we got a, man, we got a really like shattering right, uh, revelation that happened on Raw a couple weeks ago, uh, and it kind of came out of nowhere, really, genuinely, out of nowhere, October 22nd, so like a week and change before WWE, WWE's Crown Jewel, uh, which had scheduled Reigns versus Braun Strowman versus Brock Lesnar for the Universal title, uh, Roman Reigns came out on national television at the start of Monday Night Raw on October 22nd. And told the world that his leukemia that he had been battling for 11 years was back. And that he would have to relinquish his title and uh, leave Raw. And whoa, it was a very real fucking crazy moment. You think about this performer, Roman Reigns. He's this guy who, uh, sure, he gets a lot of shit. And he really does. You know, think about it, folks. Roman Reigns is the kind of guy that he, his career is like marred by... Wrong place, right time, right place, wrong time, right place, right time, too late, though, kind of. Like, it's just interesting because you look at the ebb and flow of his character and it's like, if you look at him from debut of the main roster to now, he's in the shield. And at first in the shield, he's quiet. He doesn't do a lot of talking. It's a lot of Dean. It's a lot of Seth. And Roman's kind of the silent assassin type, just big fucking, your big muscle. You know, oh my god, my cat's fucking trying to rip her fucking literal ear off. What in the shit, cat? Uh, anyways, so when he joined the shield, or when the shield was formed, it was like Roman's kind of the big silent dude, big muscle, doesn't talk a lot or whatever. 
and then they start to kind of all build personalities. There's some different individual title reigns and stuff and tag team title runs and whatnot, and the Shield just kind of running rampant and being involved in a lot of stuff. And, you know, I will always admire the Shield uh, for being a part of one of the, cra- in my opinion, one of the crazier things I had seen or I'd been a part of in professional wrestling, uh, we went to a SmackDown Live event, like not um, live show, just like a WWE house show. And at the start of the night, they had said that there was just going to be like one match with a member of the Shield versus somebody. And then it ended up turning into Team Hell No versus The Shield at the end of the night. It was going to be the main event. Huge. Fucking huge, right? So we, the crowd, learn through people that I'm sitting with who are on the internet texting and and, and, and being in the dirt sheets and whatnot. The Shield and Daniel Bryan have done a match in Minnesota the same fucking night. And then they've caught a flight directly into Chicago to get to the arena to sit for probably 15 fucking minutes and then do the match again or a, a, another match, you know, and put it all out there on the line. I mean, they double double shows in one night. That's how good the Shield was, you know. Then you had the betrayal. When you had the Shield betrayal, the interesting thing was Roman really rose to the top. Roman and Dean both were these like, fledgling up and coming baby faces and they, uh, everything looks possible. Roman should have won that one rumble. He didn't. And that was before the shield actually broke up though. But he should have won the one rumble and said they gave it to it was like fucking Batista or something I think. Batista came back. He's going into WrestleMania 30, I think. 31 maybe. I don't remember. Anyways, Reign should have won then. He doesn't win, okay? And the next year The year that Reigns does win, Daniel Bryan is the one everybody wants to win, so Reigns doesn't get the moment. He gets booed. He gets the moment, but he doesn't get to actually revel in it. No one wants him as the winner of the of the Rumble because essentially winning the Rumble at this point, you almost are guaranteed to be like the next to be in line to become champion. You're gonna be crowned champion more than likely. So Reigns gets his title shot with Lesnar. Again, Reigns wins the cha- has a chance to win the championship. They give the moment to Rollins, who cashes in his money in the bank, and wins his championship at WrestleMania and gets the moment. He's so fucking hot and over at that point that Reigns, again, doesn't get the moment. So, okay, it's fucking seeing a trend here, right? So then... Reigns gets the eventually gets the universal gold and he still gets booed constantly. They don't want him as champ. They don't want to see Roman Reigns as champion. You know, he got his moment this year at WrestleMania and they still don't want him as champ. And so what do they do? They're like, oh shit, better put the shield back together. Shield's back together and they're cheering Roman again. So he's up, up, up. He's getting back. Now he's got the he has the Universal Championship. Seth Rollins has the Intercontinental Championship. And the Shield is hot stock going up. And what happens? This shit happens with Roman. And again, he doesn't get the moment. This guy literally has had his moment taken away from him at every turn. Every time he should have been ultimately cheered and great. I mean, for the he beat The Undertaker at WrestleMania. Let's not forget that. And the crowd on Monday Night Raw chanted literally, fuck you, Roman. Fuck you, Roman. I mean, that's crazy that a professional wrestler in the modern era endured that. Stone Cold didn't get a fuck you, Stone Cold. The Rock didn't get a fuck you, Rock. That's some extreme shit, man. People really don't like Roman. So now here's where things get fucking weird because Roman is a hateable professional athlete character, right? But the guy, Joe, the guy who really is Roman Reigns, right? Uh, Joe Anoya, or Ike Anoai. I I fucking suck at saying Hawaiian names. I'm so sorry, or Samoan names. I'm the fucking worst. Don't hate me. Please don't. Seriously. But here's what I'm saying. He has this kind of... 
he has this air about him that everything's going to always be okay. And so then when you learn that after all these moments have been taken away from him, he doesn't care because he's at least getting to have moments, right? Is the is the kind of what it boils down to. He's lived with leukemia. He, he you know, that's crazy. And, uh, and survived it and is, has been a professional champion. So to him... To get booed at every turn, to not get his quote unquote moment at every turn didn't matter because he was still fulfilling his dream. This shows the character of the person that plays Roman Reigns. And that's where things are going to get really interesting. That's where, as strange as this is going to sound, he is about to become the most over ever. And it all works out in a weird way. Give it a year, folks. I, I mean, seriously, let this happen. Dude had to relinquish his title on Raw and go fight leukemia, which is real. Every person on the podcast has known some, Every person listening to this podcast, every person in the, in the world that knows somebody or is somebody that has dealt with cancer in some form. So this dude stepping up to the plate and saying, I'm not going to fucking just give up. I'm going to go and I'm going to go beat this motherfucker. Like when Roman Reigns comes back next year in the wrestling world, you think I'm kidding, and I'm really genuinely not. It's going to blow the fucking roof off of the place. Whoever your champ is at the time, make him so hated. I mean, you need to have the heelist motherfucker so that when Roman Reigns music hits and he makes the rundown, nails that fucking Superman punch, and hits the fucking spear that the place that he returns at blows off the roof because of his return. And he deserves it. He really does. Listen, this dude, I've dogged on Roman Reigns as an athlete because I think that the company has done him wrong and done him disservices and injustices. And I'll be very frank with you about that. I think Roman Reigns is an amazing athlete. I just think he's been poorly utilized. I think he's been shuffled in weird ways. I think he's had odd setbacks that have befuddled him in ways that he didn't expect. I think that trying to get the ultimate rub from, I mean, essentially now you've got this lesnar Reigns feud that had been happening for a few years. It's like the only two guys that have ever beat The Undertaker at fucking WrestleMania. And here we are, they're going at each other, you know? But guys, here's the crazy thing. So that's the real world side of wrestling. Roman announces leukemia battle. He leaves with the, he leaves the title. It's done. Uh, he does get reunited with his Shield brothers. There's uh, he didn't tell anybody by the way. So like Seth is crying. Dean looks really hurt, kinda. Um, but it's interesting because again, we're still in professional wrestling land. So by the time the night ends. The Shield, what's left of the Shield, Reigns and Ambrose, or Rollins and Ambrose, I'm sorry, uh, are put into a tag match up against, uh, oh, who the fuck is it? Wasn't it, uh, oh, Drew McIntyre and Dolph Ziggler. Fuck me, I don't know why I couldn't think of that. So Drew McIntyre and Dolph Ziggler versus the remaining members of the Shield and Rollins and Ambrose for the tag team titles. And, you know, it's it's really interesting to me because this match had a lot of emotion. The match was really great. Ultimately, in a shocker, the, uh, the Shield wins the tag team titles. Holy shit. There's hugging. There's crying. There's a moment together. You know, like all these things. And then Dean just fucking turns on Seth, beats the ever-living piss and Cheetos out of him. I mean, he just beat the piss and Cheetos out of him, guys. It's the truth. It was bad, right? And you get this interesting moment where on a very real night in wrestling where Roman has to give it all up, a very wrestling moment happens... And it's so good because the real thing happened. Granted, there had been talk that Dean was going to turn on the shield, 
not really a big surprise. But what a fucking moment to do it. Because I kind of thought, oh, well now, keep them together longer. Let it be, you know, let this change the dynamic for a minute. You can really play on this, you know. We still don't know what happened. There still have not been any words as to why Dean Ambrose turned on his brother in the shield. So, let's move into the next thing on the docket, which is very controversial. We've been talking about it a little bit here. I had said boycott it. I did not give the WWE my money to watch it, so I guess in some way I did boycott it. But talking about the crown jewel event from the WWE, this event had already been very, very, very heavily marked in controversy um, with... Uh, you know, it had already been under scrutiny, WWE dealing with the accusations that they had, you know, um, several severe human rights abuses. Uh, they were leading a war of attrition in Yemen and suppressing women's rights. The Greatest Rumble only had male performers. So it's funny because here we go. It's like a WWE evolution. All the women are performing. WWE crown jewel. The women aren't allowed here. It's all boys only. If you're a, if you're a lady, get the fuck out. Except for you, Renee Young, who got more television time than her husband. Just saying. Just saying. Uh, anyways, shit gets a lot more real with this because there's the killing of Jamal Khashoggi at the hands of the Saudi agents. The WWE had been really kind of putting a rock and a hard place with. Democratic and Republican senators across the board saying, you guys cannot do this event in Saudi Arabia. It will not. That's not good. Um, of course, um, Linda McMahon is on Donald Trump's cabinet, which is fucked up. And they essentially said, look, if Donald Trump doesn't say it, we're going. Like Until he says something, we're going to go. And uh, a lot of people called for the WWE to reconsider doing business with Saudi, uh, the Saudi kingdom. However... Uh, it looks like they obviously went. So it's interesting because a couple people didn't go in the wake of the Kashigi murders. Uh, you had John Cena, who said he was not going to go, and Daniel Bryan, who also did not go. That led to some interesting things leading up to this event. One thing being John Cena, who was never on TV to do anything for this, uh, was easily replaced by Bobby Lashley at the hands of Baron Corbin, who just said, hey, Baron Corbin, thank you for being the Shannon of Finn Balor. Or Baron Corbin. Bobby Lashley, thank you for being the Shannon of Finn Balor. I'm going to grant you this match because you earned it on like somebody named John Cena who didn't do anything to get into the match, which is true. So the other person was Daniel Bryan, who said he wouldn't go. He had a match against AJ Styles for the WWE Championship slated for Crown Jewel. What do you do? You bump it to the October 30th SmackDown, essentially the, the go-home show. Uh, of of the week to head into Crown Jewel. You have a barn burner of a match between AJ and Daniel Bryan. Amazing match on SmackDown. Back and forth. Could have went either way. I wish DB would have won, but hey, that makes it even harder because then he really can't go to Crown Jewel. It was always the plan for him to lose at Crown Jewel, however. Interesting to note, I will say that uh, I think it was Walt, what culture, Cultaholic, somebody had said that behind the scenes they had actually talked, oh, it was Wrestling Observer, uh, Dave Meltzer talking about how uh, WWE had actually gone so far as to, for the at-home audience, mind you, they were going to green screen AJ Styles versus Daniel Bryan from a remote location in the States. So they wouldn't have got it over in Saudi Arabia, but the States would have got it, and it would have been on TV as such. They were going to kind of like green screen them into Saudi Arabia to make it seem like they were there. It proved to be too difficult, and they decided to bump the title match to SmackDown, which was good. It worked out because it was a great match, and it did a great things for SmackDown. It had a lot of people talking, obviously. So they obviously promoted the show. However, I one thing to mention. After this whole thing with the murder of the uh, Jamal Khashoggi, um, Kashagi, I'm not sure if I'm saying that right. But um, after that, WWE stopped using the word Saudi Arabia at all to reference the event location. We're going to get into that in a minute, too. So uh, tickets were supposed to go on sale the day that the Saudi government confirmed that the death was actually within the consulate. 
uh, before they had officially said they did it on purpose. Uh, so WWE had to remove the tickets and wait. They then decided to go on with the event. They put the tickets on sale for cheap. The place sold out really fast. Let's get to the actual event. They had one pre-show match. It was a singles match for the United States Championship. Shinsuke Nakamura versus Rusev. Obviously, Shinsuke maintaining this his uh, United States Championship against Rusev. And um, not really much to say here. Pretty much the same match they've been having every time Shinsuke and Rusev face off. So a lot of this event was the World Cup qualifying matches and the quarterfinals and semifinal match, obviously, the final match. So the first match on the official pay-per-view was Rey Mysterio defeating Randy Orton. Uh, it was a quick match, only 5 minutes and 30 seconds. Ray gets a quick roll-up pin on Randy Orton, who is shocked, stultified, confused, angry, and attacks Ray, hits him with an RKO, beats the shit out of him, essentially leaving him for dead, right? So, okay, interesting. Ray wins, but he's hurt. Okay, so good to know. So next, you have The Miz versus Jeff Hardy, where The Miz defeats Jeff Hardy in 7 minutes and 5 seconds. Not a bad match. Pretty pretty standard to these two's uh, typical work style. Uh, good back and forth. Ultimately, The Miz picks up the win here. Up next, we had Bobby Lashley versus Seth Rollins. Leo Rush in Bobby Lashley's corner. Another drink break bo- brought to you by Porn Entertainment this Tuesday, Journey into Comics Network. Hope you guys are tuning in. Sorry, I had to belch a little bit. Jeez. Whew. I made this delicious dinner, and it's... Kind of wrecking my internals right now, folks. And, of course, up next we had Dolph Ziggler with Drew McIntyre versus Kurt Angle. Kurt Angle returning to his first singles official singles match in some time. What a great match. Back and forth again. Awesome, awesome match. I thought Kurt had a strong opportunity to win. Ultimately, Dolph Ziggler comes off with the victory. Hits him with his, I think he hit him with the zigzag. No, I think he hit him with the famous at the end to win the match. Uh, good match, though. So what we end up having is going to be the Miz versus Ray and Seth versus Dolph uh, going into the semifinals here in a little bit. To mix it up and to give the, the World Cup participants a minute to breathe, we had The Bar, which is Sheamus and Cesaro with the big show, up against The New Day, which was Big E and Kofi with Xavier on the side. Uh, the New Day came out on a magic carpet. I don't know about that. I don't know if that was the right. It was a little, ooh, I don't, I didn't feel good about it, I guess is the way I want to say that, right? So, uh, ultimately the bar wins, defeating the New Day, and maintaining the SmackDown Tag Team Championships. Up next we had another World Cup Qualifying match, The Miz versus Rey Mysterio. Rey playing off the injury, uh, still working his ass off, making the match look good, back and forth, back and forth. Ultimately, The Miz wins the match. Moving on to the finals. Dolph Ziggler versus Seth Rollins. Dolph Ziggler defeating Seth Rollins. And now we have The Miz versus Dolph Ziggler in the finals. That's an interesting... Okay, okay. I'm all about it. Let's get there. Let's get there. Up next, AJ Styles versus Samoa Joe. So in the wake of Daniel Bryan not wanting to go to Saudi Arabia, not being able to be green screened in, all these things. Can't use the dandy green screen. Uh, All of this ultimately leads to Samoa Joe getting a cool opportunity because then he gets to step in and face AJ for the title at the show, in the place, which they never said. They named the actual city one time. They said, what was the actual place called? It was, uh, hold on. Riyadh, okay? So they said Riyadh once, but they never said that it was in Saudi Arabia. The word Saudi Arabia never, ever, 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 ever ever, ever, ever were said. 
Also, one thing to mention, at the very, very start of the event, Hulk Hogan came out and made his return, being the first time on TV since 2015 scandal, um, and since he's been uh, put back in the Hall of Fame. Uh, here's an interesting thing to note, though. He said he was going to be the host, and then didn't really host. It was just that one thing. Very strange. So, anyways, moving even further forward, further forward even moving, uh, we had Brock Lesnar... Oh, AJ ultimately defeated Samoa Joe, forgot that, to hold on to the WWE Championship. I love that. Uh, AJ having an amazing run right now, getting getting into the 300 and some odd change day territory here. So uh, he's coming up on a year. I feel like they can stretch this to Mania, puts him in the uh, probably about the 400 day range. So I feel like they're going to want AJ to get over Punk's longest reign so that Lesnar and AJ are the top two and it's not two Paul Heyman guys one of which still has beef with the company because you got to think about shit like that so here's an interesting thing we've got this uh we've got this Brock Lesnar Braun Strowman match for the vacant now universal title mind you uh because of Roman Reigns having to vacate the title match is only about three and a half minutes long because Baron Corbin hits Braun Strowman before the match officially begins with the universal title. Lesnar goes to downtown pound town, hitting Braun Strowman with many, many, many F fives, uh, Braun Strowman kicking out after many F fives again, getting the short change on this thing, uh, and being kind of forced to lose Braun Strowman ultimately loses the match. Brock Lesnar is a, what, two or three time now, I think it is, uh, Universal Champion. I need to actually see. How many times has he won a fucking Universal Damn Championship? Let's see. Jesus Christ, his fucking, the whole thing, it's long. His whole, like, uh, I don't know what you call it. Uh, let's see here. Oh, Universal, two times. So he's only won it twice. My bad. Uh, okay, so... Lesnar defeats Braun. Braun kind of gets fucked. Sucks. I would have given it to Braun here, but I also think it's super smart to not have Braun Strowman's title win for the Universal Championship be in Saudi Arabia at this event shrouded in all of this controversy. I think that's why certain things play out how they do coming up in a minute. So Lesnar wins that. So you have no championship changes at all you have nothing that's going to make people consistently talk about this pay-per-view you're not doing anything special again no titles have changed hands nothing really that crazy has happened outside of maybe say Dolph Ziggler beating Seth Rollins was a little bit of a shocker probably saw that going the other way especially with the Miz winning then you have a heel versus face thing but then with you when you see what happens in a minute the heel versus heel thing works out better because Miz goes out there. He gets attacked a little bit. He's limping around. He jumps off the ring apron and hurts his knee and is unable to stand up. And they, like, call the match. And they're like, fucking Dolph Ziggler wins. He's the best in the world. But he didn't even wrestle or do anything for it. But Shane McMahon's out there. And he's like, nah, fuck this. I'm going in. Let me in, coach. Oh, wait, I'm the coach. I'm putting myself in, motherfuckers. Like, deal with it. Um. So... Shane puts himself in the fucking match versus Dolph and ultimately wins the fucking match. He beat Dolph Ziggler. He hit him with that coast-to-coast -coast, uh, drop kick he does from the top rope. And uh, it was that one thing that was kind of cool, though, when he, he ends that, they're both down. He grabbed the wrist of, of uh, Dolph Ziggler and did this, like, roll-through thing and then ended up putting him in a pending combination. It was really clever how Shane did that. Um, but again, Shane wins this match, and and, I'll, and I'm going to get to that in a second. So you had, again, nothing special happening here. Lesnar winning back the vacant title. He's already been a champion. Whatever. It's not special that he won. It's not a shocker that he won. It just seems like boring WWE business. Had to take an L on this one. Last match of the night was DX versus the Brothers of Destruction. 
and it was a war for 27 and a half minutes. It went back and forth and back and forth and forth and back and back and forth and forth and back and back and forth and, and again 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 and time and time and time and time and time and time again. It just kept happening over and over and over again, right? Ultimately, DX gets the win. It was a crazy back and forth match. Set up where Kane ultimately takes the pin. So it protects Taker. He still looks quote unquote strong. Um, Kane had an interesting moment in this match where his fucking mask literally got ripped off his face. Folks, his mask also includes his hair. So we had Mayor Kane in the fucking, on the outskirts of the ring, <laughs> which he has visibly seen a couple times as Mayor Kane, essentially no mask, um, back in like the, oh, it was that 05 era when he took the mask off after he betrayed RVD. But, um. His mask is off. He eventually gets the mask back on. It's really funny because there's a scene he's like laying there in this position with his mask off. And the next time you see Kane, he's still in the same fucking position, but his mask is on. It's like, man, are they hoping all their fans are this drunk or that it's like this early in the afternoon? Because it was an early afternoon show. You had to start watching at like 11 in the afternoon uh, central time. So ultimately, DX wins. They pin Kane. Uh, Shane McMahon wins the World Cup. So now... The guy who he's a part of the company, right? And the dividends and stuff. It's not a real professional wrestler who wins the World Cup, and they're not going to have that something that they can like carry around. Okay. It's just kind of like, a, okay, well, they won. The, they don't really have to mention that Shane won it. They can maybe mention it in passing for a couple weeks, but then let it go. Then forget about it because you don't want people to consistently go back and talk about this event that even happened. I mean, they're going to want to almost wipe this from the books as if they never did it. You're going to watch WWE do it, folks. They've already done it. Right in front of your eyes, they've done it. They protected all the wrestlers they needed to protect. They kept all their titles where they needed to keep them. They made all the matches exactly what they needed. They gave us a little bit of everything. A little bit of shock, a little bit of nostalgia, a little bit of past, a little bit of present, a little bit of future. The whole nine. And it was still a shit show. It was awful. I hated this card. I'm not a fan because they even went. I think that it was a poor judgment call on the WWE's part. Um, it just sets up weird things for the future, too, because you've almost set this precedent like, okay, well, a country can be fucking awful to whoever, and as long as we're making money, it doesn't matter. Fuck them. You know, as you would say. Which I'm not a fan of at all. I don't like it. All right. Well, we've only got a couple more things to talk about WWE related wise. Then we're going to get into our random highlight before we get out of here, folks. Thank you guys so much for checking out Journey into Wrestling this breezy November Sunday. Make sure to stick around later today as we will be releasing the Best of the Week show. Depending on when you're listening to this, the Best of the Week show might already actually be out. Um, it comes out on noon any sad or any it comes out noon any Sundays that have the Journey into Wrestling show on them as well. Uh, I like to give the Journey into Wrestling show a full twenty four hours of breath on the Sunday and let Best of the Week just sit there for that first twelve. It's not a big deal. <clears throat> so we don't ever have to talk about Crown Jewel again, hopefully. But let's talk about the next pay per view event that WWE has going on. Some of the already announced plans and matches that are going to be taking place. And what the future of this event holds. It is Survivor Series. We've already got three matches on the card officially. Only three. So let's see what they are. First match on the docket. Ronda Rousey, the Raw Women's Champion versus Becky Lynch, the SmackDown Women's Champion in a Champion versus Champion match. Up next, you guys guessed it, Seth Rollins, the Intercontinental Champion, versus Shinsuke Nakamura, the United States Champion, in another Champion versus Champion match. And finally, Brock Lesnar, Universal Champion, versus AJ Styles, WWE Champion, in a rematch from last year's match where they wrestled at, was it Survivor Series? Or I don't remember when that was. It was at some fucking event. When did they last have a match? I don't, I don't remember. I really don't. I suck. Uh, oh, yeah, from last year's... It's a rematch from last year's Survivor Series. I fucking thought so. Again, can't trust my own brains. Brock Lesnar, Universal Champ. AJ Styles, WWE Champ. 
going champion versus champion style at Survivor Series 2018. Let me tell you guys something, folks. If you're in the Lafayette area and you like Journey into Wrestling, you need to get your asses down to North End Pub on November 18th, the day of Survivor Series 2018. Because let me tell you something, guys. We've got an event going on. I'm pretty sure it's going to take place at like... I think we're going to have, probably have to start at like 2 or 3 in the afternoon realistically to do what we want to do because we're going to have several hours of podcasting that's going to happen. It's going to be weird because that's going to be a day where Journey into Wrestling does not drop on Sunday before the best of the week. It'll have to come out after. I'll actually have to edit it and everything from the venue and the event and then get it up ASAP. But we're going to be covering Survivor Series. We're going to be talking about the fallout from NXT TakeOver War Games, which is the second year they're doing War Games around Survivor Series time. And we're going to get into that card in a second. We're going to be having special guests, Nick Maxson, Casey Taylor from North and Pub, um, several other people that have been um, essentially asking and begging to be a part of Journey into Wrestling. We're going to have them on. We're going to have a little get-together. It's not, you know... I did have a more grandiose plan for this thing. And with the way life has been, it's fucking insane, man. And it just gets impossible. So we're going to do this first event a little smaller than I'd like. It's going to be mainly a podcasting-based event, but then you're still going to get to hang out at North End Pub, watch the Professional Wrestling Survivor Series WWE event. And then when it's done, you go, oh, man, that's all it is. That's the whole night. This is going to be so much fun. We hope to see you guys there. North End Pub. You guys will be getting details very soon. We'll have a hopefully have a flyer out for you. ASASAP. Uh, I'll be working on that, Casey. I promise, dude. All right, let's move on to Survivor Series. Let's talk about this NXT TakeOver War Games card real quick. Got a couple matches on this card. Really looking forward to. Let's talk about it first. Tomasa Ciampa, the NXT champ, up against Velveteen Dream, who totally deserves this title match. I'm secretly, not really secretly, I guess because I'm saying it here, Velveteen Dream is who I want to see win this match. I know Tommaso Ciampa, great heel champ. It's fun. I think Velveteen has worked his ass off and totally deserves it. And I think Tommaso Ciampa and Johnny Gargano, their beef is kind of in the past a little bit. Not like so much, but enough to where if you need Tommaso Ciampa to move up to the main roster, now's the time. You guys have lost a bunch of dudes, and you need some more vicious dudes up there. KO is out. Reigns is gone. You've got, um I'm trying to think of a bunch of other. I mean, there's there are several injuries that have happened on the main roster, and uh, I think they need to call some people up. Up next on the card is going to be Alistar Black versus Johnny Gargano. We find out that Alistar Black's attacker back at TakeOver Brooklyn 4 was actually Johnny Gargano. Johnny Football himself turned heel. A heel, essentially a heel card that had been played way back. And they they slow burned it. And eventually rolled the card over here and they reveal who it really was. It's Johnny Gargano. He's a bad guy. Oh, shit. Let's talk about it. Last year's champions of the war games, the Undisputed Era, Adam Cole, Bay Bay, Bobby Fish, Kyle O'Reilly, and Roderick Strong taking on Pete Dunne, Ricochet, and the War Raiders in the return of the war games match. Holy shish kebab. Looking forward to this card. Going to be great to talk about. That's another thing when we're doing the podcast. We're also going to talk about some classic War Games pay-per-views and some of the classic matches from those cards way back when. So we've got kind of like a loose basis plan for what that event is going to be like. But essentially it's going to be a long day of podcasting, talking and nerding out about wrestling. And if we tangent off a little bit, we tangent off a little bit. If it goes into Bruise with Dudes at some point, well, fuck it. We're doing a little bit of Bruise with Dudes. That's the way shit goes. We're going to be doing a real relaxed event in a real relaxed environment. North and Pub is a lot of fun. If you guys have not been down there, please do yourselves a favor if you're in the Lafayette area and check it out. It's great. I do highly recommend it. All right. So we've got the War Games talk done. We've got all this shit done. Random number generator time because we're going to do the random highlight, folks. Here's the deal. Last time was Paul Heyman. He is a manager, so i got to put another manager up there. Let's do Paul Bear. Another Paul, okay? 
So Paul Bear is slot eight. So to run it down, here's who we have on our random highlight list of people that we can highlight and talk about. Number one, the Dudleys. Number two, the Miz. Number three, Johnny Impact. Number four, Roddy Piper. Number five, Samoa Joe. Number six, Lita. Number seven, Kenny Omega. Number eight, Paul Bear. Number nine, Y2J. And number 10, Stinger. We last time rolled eight, so that means we're going to do eight clicks of the number generator to figure out who our next random highlight is. So I'm going to close my eyes and do eight clicks, and then we're going to open them up and see where we go. Ready, guys? Here we go. And one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay, well, as per the rule I said, it cannot repeat the number that was last pulled, right? So it was eight. Let's go again. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. It's ten. Oh my God, we're going to talk about him. One of my favorite professional wrestlers, Sting. And Sting is one of those guys that he is the reason I love wrestling as much as I do, folks. Let me tell you something. I loved the Stinger back when he was in the old school surf attire and was kind of like the, you know, the happy-go-lucky heart and soul of WCW. Uh, you know, I got to beautifully, beautifully watch his transformation and transition into the um, the silent terror that was this. You know, this the um, I guess you'd call him the goth sting, I guess, but the creepier sting, right? The against the NWO sting, and they just ran that having him in the rafters and. Just all the stuff they did with him, man, what a legend in the game. And I mean, Sting had some great matches against all kinds of all kinds of amazing com uh, competitors. Ric Flair, Lex Luthor, Luger, uh, Hulk Hogan, Triple H, strangely enough. That's a weird one to say. Um, AJ Styles, Samoa Joe, Kurt Angle. Uh, famously a match against Jeff Hardy where Jeff Hardy is so fucked up, Sting had to put him out of his misery essentially in the match. I mean, Sting went to all... He's been all a part of pretty much all the major companies except, except for like ECW essentially. He's held a lot of titles. Uh, U.S. champion, world champion, TNA champion, uh, tag champions multiple times. Uh, you know, Stinger, man... He's one of my favorites, genuinely. And uh, when he did the Wolfpack Sting, I loved that. Uh, his matches with Mr. Anderson at Slammiversary was awesome. He's had, I mean, so many iconic moments. They do call him the Icon Sting. And, you know, he, if you look at his list, okay, I'm going to just go down his list of awards mixed with it's essentially his championships and his accomplishments. He was the NWA World Television Champion one time, NWA World Heavyweight Champion one time, WCW International World Heavyweight Champion two times, WCW United States Heavyweight Champion six or uh, two times, uh, WCW World Heavyweight Champion six times, WCW World Tag Team Champion three times, one time with Luger, one time with the Giant, one time with Kevin Nash. Uh, he won the Jim Crockett Senior Memorial Cup in 88 with Lex Luger. Uh, he won the Iron Man Tournament in 89. London Lethal Lottery Tag Team Tournament in 2000 with Scott Steiner. King of the Cable Tournament in 92. European Cup in 94 and 2000. WCW United States Championship Tournament in 91 and in 95. The Battle Bowl Battle Royal in 91. And he is the third ever WCW Triple Crown, Triple Crown Champion. Per Pro Wrestling Illustrated, he is the comeback of the year in 2006, 2011, and 14. Match of the year in 91 with Lex Luger versus the Steiner Brothers at Super Brawl 1. Most Improved Wrestler of the Year in 88. Most Inspirational Wrestler of the Year in 1990. Most Popular Wrestler of the Year in 91, 92, 94, and 97. Wrestler of the Year in 90. Ranked number one in the top 500 singles wrestlers in the PWI 592. Ranked 15 in the top 500 single wrestlers of the PWI years in 2003. Ranked 52 in the top 100 tag teams of PWI years with Lex Luger in 2003. He uh, joined the Professional Wrestling Hall of Fame, uh, which is in Wichita Falls, Texas, uh, in 2018. 
He was in TNA where he won their NWA World Heavyweight Championship one time, the TNA World Heavyweight Championship four times, TNA World Tag Team Championships one time with Kurt Angle. He was an inspirational superstar of the year in 2007. TNA Match of the Year versus Kurt Angle at Bound for Glory. TNA Match of the Year 2009 versus AJ Styles at Bound for Glory. TNA Hall of Fame Class of 2012. He was Universal Wrestling Federation Champion. Uh, the Tag Team Champion three times with twice with Eddie Gilbert, once, once with Rick Steiner. World Wrestling All-Stars Heavyweight Champion one time. He is a WWE Hall of Famer Class of 2016. Two-time Slammy Award winner. Um, his return in this is awesome moment, helping, uh, debuting to help team Cena defeat team authority at survivor series surprise return of the year as Seth Rollins statue and attacks Rollins on raw. I remember that, uh, per the wrestling observer newsletter, he won match of the year in 1988 versus Ric Flair at clash of champions. One most charismatic in 88 and 92 most improved in 88 most unimproved in 1990, best babyface in 92, worst worked match of the year 1995 versus Tony Palmore at Battle 7, worst worked match of the year 2011 versus Jeff Hardy at Victory Road, uh, owning to Hardy's inebriation. That's the famous drunk match or where he was all fucked up on pills and and Sting just beat him. I don't know that Sting was supposed to beat him, but he did. Um, and, of course, he joined, uh, Sting joined the Wrestling Observer Newsletter Hall of Fame in 2016. Uh, Sting is an amazing, accomplished uh, professional wrestler. Broke in with uh, Ultimate Warrior, another legend. Someone who's you can greatly talk about. Thinking about Sting and thinking about classic matches, I remember Starcade 97 versus Hogan. Or you think about like... Um, it's weird because I think about like interesting moments with Sting and like the Wolfpack and... That whole thing, it was very, it was very, it was a very amazing time to be a professional wrestling fan back then. So, uh, I loved Sting. He is one of my favorites. I, I will always and forever and forever and always say that Steve Borden as the professional wrestler Sting is amazing. I'm not really a fan of some of his personal beliefs, but I digress. All right, folks. Well, I think that is actually probably going to do it for this week's episode of Journey into Wrestling. Be sure to check in with us next episode. That's two weeks from now. We will be live from North End Pub. You guys are going to be checking that episode out a little bit later than we planned. You're not going to have us on that best of the week, so don't get scared. It's because we're going to be dropping later that night. It's going to be kind of a special in conjunction with the drop of Survivor Series. It's going to be our Survivor Series special. Anyways, folks, you can check out Journey Into Wrestling on the Journey Into Comics Network at journeyintocomics.com or go to iTunes, Podbean, Stitcher Radio, Google Play Music, Spotify, CastBox, whatever the fuck you're listening to, Podchaser, however you listen, however you ingest your podcasts. Search Journey Into Comics Network. That's where you get, once you subscribe to us, you get all the shows on the network. And if you only like one show, it's easy. You just scroll through and find your show and you click it. Whenever you want to fucking watch, listen to whatever we're doing, whichever shows you like. Who knows? Maybe you accidentally stumble on another show you get into. Who knows? I mean, we do release shows 24-7, 365. I don't mean 24. We're not releasing one 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We do go seven days a week, though, 365. That's for damn sure. That's for damn skippy hippie. So, folks, you can also check us out at Patreon. Go to patreon.com backslash journey into comics. Give us a dollar, please. We're begging of you. We need it. You get that early access. You get that exclusive content. You get it before anybody else. That's going to do it this week, folks, for this week's episode of Journey into Wrestling. This is Journey into Wrestling Season 3, Episode 7. I don't know how we're going to fucking green screen this one. I don't know what we're going to call this episode, folks. I had one earlier, but I forgot to write it down because I don't have a pen because I'm a dumbass. So this is what we're going with. I'm not sure what we're going to title this one, folks. So for Journey into Wrestling... I've been Nate. Thank you guys so much for checking it out and have an awesome day. Later.